T-Bob, we are going to get to what Ed Ogeron had to say yesterday, but I want to start with an Arkansas connection. Brad yeah. Davis coming over, new offensive line yeah. coach. What have you heard and seen about Brad Davis so far? The uh, the, the the Brad Davis. Now, uh, granted, look, so t- I take all of this with a grain of salt uh, more this year because it, Doing this job, whatever, any job in life, right? Anything you do in life, it's all a learning process. You learn new things every year. And so certainly last year and the experience watching LSU through the offseason to then what the regular season became gives me a little more pause in believing all the sunshine and rainbows about coaching hires and everything during the summer. That said, the anecdotal evidence on Coach Davis is that it's been really damn good thus far. This is a cat that I know that a lot of teams wanted already, right, and and, and had pursued and maybe hadn't been able to lure away. And I, I know that as far as the staff is concerned, they feel like Davis has really slotted in nicely. I, I, through recruiting, he already had relationships with some of the guys that are currently on the team. And really, when you talk about recruiting, I think that's maybe where – People's expectations are the most hopeful because the previous line coach, James Craig, if there was one area where he kind of struggled, it was landing the big top guys. And I think they believe that Brad Davis will be able to change that. So, I mean, everything I've heard, I mean, one of the direct quotes I heard from somebody inside the program said, like, a, a complete game changer. Now, again, I don't, I don't. I'm not believing everything I hear as much anymore, but it seems to be very positive thus far. <laughs> Late, Tommy, yeah. we, we was, was the last time a guy was brought in? Well, he wasn't quite the upgrade we were hoping. You know? yeah, exactly, I've yet to read right. that headline. Exactly right, but 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 there are. I mean, you know, y'all know in this business there are still ways to read between the lines, and 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 you get guys in more honest situations where maybe you you get a more real picture and. Even then, I haven't sensed anything. I haven't sensed that with Davis yet. But but then again, it's been a few weeks. And what are they doing right now? They're recruiting and doing football school and doing some meetings and stuff. So, like, you know, you, you, you're never really going to know how strong those relationships are until the, the pressure of the season is applied to them. Yeah, so uh, talking with T-Bob Herbert, LSU football here on uh, the morning rush. Quarterback position, we we talked a lot about the quarterbacks in the SEC West. Uh, Max Johnson's uh, the guy that's kind of, when you read about LSU in the preseason publications, uh, is, he, is he the guy you're looking for to be the, the first one to trot out there this fall? Uh, I don't know. I, I honestly don't have a great read or opinion on who will win the job. I think if we were to like handicap it from a percentage standpoint because of Max's legs, as well as because of the two and O record last year, I think that he kind of, if this was a NASCAR race, right? He has pole position entering camp, but it's like a 55% to 45, maybe like, I think this is a legitimate camp competition. And I actually think LSU will be really good at that position. No matter who wins the job. I, I don't have I, I have LSU at nine and three. That's where I've consistently been. That does not adjust if it's Max Johnson or Miles Brennan. And the reasons being because I mean look what Miles played in three games last year. He threw for eleven touchdowns over a thousand yards, three picks, right? So he was averaging three seventy five a game and three and a half touchdowns. Max didn't quite have those numbers, but he obviously won these big games. Mm-hmm. So like I, I I feel it's it's crazy. Probably the greatest thing. Now that I have to prove it this year. But what I believe after this year will be, I'll be talking about it in LSU country is one of the greatest conferences that Coach O has done is changing LSU from a you know a place where quarterbacks went to die where quarterbacks can go to mm-hmm. thrive. Yeah, and that's been one of the uh, yeah the, the quarterback conversation has been so central to the coaching conversation with Les Miles. Uh, yep. With Coach O, yep. uh, you know, Dennis Dodd came out with his hot seat rankings for the coaches in the SEC a week ago, and uh, Coach Ogeron was the only one above a two. And now there's a lot of new coaches in this league that haven't even had time to have their seat warm up. But do you think that's an accurate ranking that Ed Orgeron's the only coach really that, that even has a, a warm seat to a hot seat in this league that that, that, that kind of pressure is that on? Is that accurate uh, with you being that close to it? Would you say Ed Orgeron's really under the gun this year to get it done or his job's on the line? You know, I don't I don't think so. I mean, you are just a year removed from 15-0 and in a national championship. Now, certainly Scott Woodward is a new AD, and ADs tend to like to get their own guys in there, right? Uh, but it's it, you're still too close to a championship. It m- maybe, you know, if, if things were to go 
catastrophically bad and you go like three and five in the SEC or something along those lines, I think it's almost more of a uh, social hot seat, right, where finally after kind of uniting the fan base and getting everybody fully behind him after 2019, if you had gone like seven and three last year and had a pretty good year, that would have been fine. That unification would have held. I think that the five and five year, and especially how bad it was, like defensively and stuff, I think that caused a lot of people who were outside of the O camp pre national championship just to revert right back to that stance. It's like, oh well, he got lucky in twenty nineteen, and then and he can't create a consistent winner. And it, it, it's just funny though. It's it's the same criticism that Coach O's been dealing with his entire life. It, it it's just. It, even the natty couldn't fully dispel it. So there's, there's a there's a lesson to be learned there about college football fans. What have you done for me lately and the value of consistency? We're talking with T-Bob Herbert this morning on the morning rush. LSU uh, off the bench, ESPN 104.5 in Baton Rouge. T-Bob, I heard Derek Stingley say in his opening statement he feels like that there's going to be real chemistry on this year's team. And I don't yeah. know if I read in too much into that, but I, several other people seem to. Was there a chemistry issue this past year, and do you think these hires and this team are going to blend together better for LSU? Absolutely. Uh, no, I think you read that perfectly, right? I think that's – I don't think it's something like that is said by mistake. Um, I, I, I think, uh, yes, look, last year the staff lost the locker room. Uh, the reasons are probably many. For whatever reason, Bo Pelini never clicked with that defense. Like mm-hmm. – you, you, you can see it if you just watch the games. Guys never knew what they were doing. Everybody always had their arms up in the air. On the sideline, Pelini would be, like, yelling at him, and guys would just be looking off in the distance, like, ignoring him. It was just a horrible look all around. And when you look at the hires in general last season, the five guys that they let, that, that left this offseason, they were, like, an average age of 51, right? The guys that they brought in to replace them were, like, an average age of 37. So you're talking about a significant youth movement among LSU to try to get younger, to try to reconnect with this locker room. And then in Durante Jones, not only do you have a guy who, I mean, he's been coaching secondaries for Mike Zimmer in the NFL for Juana. That's like, you know, learning at the, yeah, that's like being a painter and learning at the feet of Da Vinci or something, right? Or, or Michelangelo. Like, that's like learning under the master. And so because, and, and, and so everything you're hearing is that, the players have connected with them. They now understand the scheme. And, look, I don't think you can overlook this fact. Uh, Durante Jones is so crazy in a sport that is majority black athletes. Durante Jones is the first black coordinator in LSU school history. I think there was, like, one OC oh, wow. or something for, like, a year or something crazy like that. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I, don't, I don't discount that mm-hmm. either when it comes to connecting with, this, with, with, with the team. And so I think it's um, – Yes, I think they had a massive chemistry problem this year, and I do think that is gone now. So Pete Thamel yesterday was, I think, the only one in the big room to ask about the Title IX lawsuit, which Coach Ed Ogeron has been named a defendant in. Being down in Baton Rouge, and we don't have to get into specifics, but do you think that's impacting the football program and and taking away – from focusing on practice in this upcoming season. So it's 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 kind of a weird thing where and it's so hard to talk about in these like radio questions because there's it's there's so many different actual Tentacles like suits and, yeah. and counter suits and like so much kind of complexity and density there. But no, ironically the latest suit has kind of shut down the story a little bit because now everybody answers it just like what O said, right? Legally within his rights. You're like, well, it's an ongoing investigation. I can't comment. And so I, I don't know. It kind of feels like it all might die on the vine. We'll have to see. The, the, the rub, the tough part for LSU is that the main power players from when the suits take place are all gone, right? The AD, the president of the school, and the head coach – are all no longer there from the time. Now, O is aimed in like some ancillary uh, type, but not like the main Tile 9 suit. So like I said, it's super dense and complex. But I don't, if I had to guess, I don't foresee any like job losses or anything like that coming out of LSU, actually. Let's talk about this schedule a little bit because it's, it's got to be a lot of fun to talk about going to the Rose Bowl to start the season, playing UCLA right oh, out of yeah. the bat September the 4th. Um, how motivating is that game, do you think, for these players and these coaches, knowing you got a Power 5 opponent, 
uh, an historic site and venue uh, right out of the gate going uh, going out to Pasadena. Uh, look, I love having a major Power 5 opponent off the bat. I, I think, and, and whatever, it's probably just because in my time in college, I had good experiences with it, right? We started one season playing North Carolina and Atlanta. We had a huge top five matchup to kick off the season against Oregon and Jerry World one year. And to me, the great value of it was that throughout the off season, it provided this kind of mm-hmm. point of focus, right? Like you couldn't go half step and you couldn't kind of put things off or be lackadaisical because you had to be ready from the jump. I mean, I'll never forget our strength conditioning coordinator, Tommy Moffitt. It's like January, right? We just <laughs> ended the season. It's just January workouts. And he's like yelling at us about like Oregon and their pace and how fast they play. So it like, it does become this, like I said, this like rallying cry, this point of focus for, uh, for, for, for the boys to get ready on. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's like anything else in life. It's, it's a big risk versus reward play. If you lose, that has the potential to send you into a tailspin. If you win, it becomes this kind of great confidence launching point. Yeah. I, I know UCLA's won. McNeese State, there's an angle with Coach's son. And Central yeah. Michigan are games two and three. But I, w- I want to ask you about Mississippi State, which is the first conference game, game four, September 25th, because that's the game where it started to unravel last year. Mississippi State uh, you know, they were ready to crown Costello the Heisman Trophy winner after that game. And how motivating is that game to, to kind of get, A, the, the, the conference schedule on track, and, B, uh, do, do you feel like there's any payback for last year and what happened in that game? Yeah, I'm going to go out on a limb and say the <laughs> fellas are going to want to win that one. Right. right? <laughs> and pretty handy. I mean, this is, a, this is a defense that features Derek Stingley Jr. and Eli Ricks. Now, granted, he didn't play in the Mississippi State game last year, but you said, like, Jacoby Stevens, like, he had draft picks. And you let K.J. Costello, a player that would be benched just a few weeks later, you'd have him throw for over 600 yards. Mm-hmm. I've never seen anything like it. Like, people talk about medic- medical malpractice. That was the only <laughs> time in my life I've seen coaching malpractice. Just like a complete refusal to adjust in any way. The dumbest part is Washington laid out the game plan. On how to on, on on how to stop there like like playing man the entire game and never changing anything it's just it's 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 wild man it's 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 wild to think about so yeah I think they're going to be very motivated to get one back on Mississippi State T Bob before we let you go first of all we appreciate you joining us oh, yeah. this morning kind of the catalyst of the Gabriel's karaoke experience just walked by us in Barrett Salee what song <laughs> are you going to be singing? tomorrow night uh, okay i i hope they have it but i would love to sing uh in honor of jack black uh, and tenacious d i would love to sing the song kickapoo which is from the opening of tenacious d in the pick of destiny it's fantastic it's got jack black in it it's got meatloaf it's got dio in it it is an epic song in uh in more ways than one Tommy, are you because I was not familiar when he told me that prior to coming on. Are you familiar with that song? No, I, I'll uh, I'll need to get on my Amazon Music and uh, do a little yeah, search on that. Do not play it on the show. Do not play it on the show. <laughs> <laughs> the, Thank uh, you for pain, the warning. Painfully clear about that. Do not play it on the show. <laughs> T. T. Bob Herbert, one zero four five Baton Rouge, uh, ESPN seven to ten off off the bench. T. Bob, we appreciate it, buddy. Yeah, and, uh, look forward to the rest of this week. Y'all have a great day, dude. All, All right. right.